Did everything go well this time? There was every chance of it. In phase one, with the first stage, the flight went normally. But when the time came to separate the stages, the first hit the second right when it started its engine. So the second stage couldn't continue its flight. The fourth and fifth launches showed good results. But that wasn't enough. The main problem with the Falcon 1 was low demand due to its low payload abilities. For this reason, development of the rocket stopped. It was decided to do something more serious, namely the Falcon 9. This device can carry on board almost 23 tons of cargo. Imagine that... Send stuff from the Earth to space. I'll start with this. SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket manages to send space to the International Space Station, or even a lander and rover. The rocket works by throwing stuff out the back, literally. It makes use of Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. If the action is to toss something to the left, then the reaction will be that the tosser will be moved to the right. We'll demonstrate using this spring driven rocket. This is the spring. This chunk of copper is the reaction mass that's going to be far away. This uh, thread right here that goes through the whole thing is what holds it all together. Okay, so let's hang it up. This is kind of I'll try to cut the thread, I'll burn it. The spring will throw the chunk of copper to the left while the rocket reacts by flying to the right. In a rocket used for going from the Earth to space, the mass that's thrown out is the byproduct of burning the fuel with an oxidizer, usually liquid oxygen. This oxygen is needed just like it is down here on Earth for keeping a plane lit. Together they're called a propellant, since it's ultimately what propels the rocket forward. In a solid fuel rocket, like the two that go on the space shuttle, the propellant is usually a solid cylinder that gradually burns from the inside out, throwing the burnt results out the back. In a liquid fuel rocket, such as one using kerosene and liquid oxygen, the two liquids are mixed together and then burned. The advantage of this over the solid fuel rocket is that it can be turned on or off as needed. Another type of rocket is a hybrid of the two, where the fuel is a solid cylinder again, but an oxidizer is sprayed through the middle of the cylinder. As long as the spray continues, the rocket keeps firing. When the spray is stopped, the rocket stops firing. But that arrangement alone won't always get you as far as you want to go. For example, to the International Space Station. The problem is that a single rocket like this is too heavy to go all the way, so a solution is to make the rocket lighter as it goes up. It may get lighter as more and more propellant is burnt and thrown at the back, but that's not good enough. So a rocket is broken up into multiple stages, sort of like having multiple rockets stacked on top of each other. SpaceX's Falcon 9, for example, has just two stages. Once the propellant is used up for the first stage, the whole stage is separated and left to fall back to Earth, usually into the ocean. Then the next stage is started up, and when it runs out of propellant, that one too is thrown away. But there's a problem. Once the rocket gets to space and runs out of propellant, if it's not going fast enough, then the Earth's gravity will eventually slow it down until it stops and falls back again. There are two things that fix this problem. The first is that any object set in motion will keep moving unless something else affects that motion. This is Newton's first law, loosely worded. We don't think this way on Earth because there's always something to slow us down. An example is when we throw a ball, the air slows the ball down. But in the space near the Earth, there's very little air. And so once something is set in motion, it'll keep moving for a long time before the few atoms it does run into slow it down enough to require another push. The second thing that's needed to fix the problem is the rocket's speed. We all know what happens when you throw a ball up in the air. The ball falls back down because gravity pulls it back down. But what if you throw it so it goes faster? It'll go further before falling back down. Theoretically, you could even throw it fast enough that by the time it does fall, it'll already be over the horizon. It's even theoretically possible that you could throw it fast enough that it makes a complete circle around the Earth. It would circle around because gravity keeps pulling it toward the Earth. Meanwhile, its forward speed keeps it from being pulled all the way down. When the speed is just right for the amount of gravity that's pulling on it at that height, then it just keeps circling. And remember, an object in motion keeps its motion unless there's something to slow it down. And in the space near Earth, it takes a while before the very thin atmosphere has a big effect. This is called orbiting, and when you've done it, you're said to have reached orbit, or to be in orbit. And that's how a rocket can run out of propellant and stay in space near the Earth without falling back down to the Earth. 
The International Space Station is an example of something that's in orbit right now. It's around 217 miles, or 350 kilometers up, and traveling 17,240 miles per hour, or 27,700 kilometers per hour. And finally, if you want to go from the Earth directly to the Moon, then you need to go even faster. The faster initial push is needed in order to get all the way out of the pull of the Earth's gravity before it can slow you to a stop and pull you back. For example, Astrobotic Technology is planning on using a Falcon 9 rocket to send a lander and rover to the Moon sometime in 2015. We'll still use only two stages, but the lander and rover are light enough that that will be sufficient to do the job. Kind of like the difference between how you control a lightweight ball farther than you control a heavy ball. That's how a rocket works to send stuff from the surface of the Earth up to space. Well, thanks for watching. Be sure to check out my YouTube channel, Rimstar Org, for more science and tech related videos. You'll find everything from how nuclear fusion works in the sun, how to do solar cooking using only a car sunshade, and how to make a crystal radio that doesn't need batteries. And don't forget to subscribe if you like these videos, or give a thumbs up, or leave a question or comment below. See you in a bit. Books are very good. We are going to get a lot of money. We are going to get a lot of money. We are going to get a lot of money. We are going to get a lot of money. this video, I'm going to show you how to make a handful of remote-controlled electric igniters from things you already have around the house. It'll ignite fireworks safely and from a distance, or launch your homemade rockets with a simple press of a button. To start this project, you'll just need a book of paper matches, some tape, and an old cell phone charger. Chances are you have a spare charger somewhere in the house, but if not, you can easily find them at thrift stores for about a dollar. Now get to work with a pair of scissors and carefully chop the head and charge controller off the cable and cut it up into smaller pieces around two inches long. If you remove the outer jacket, you can see there are two insulated wires inside made of very thin stranded copper wires. And for this project, the thinner the wires are, the better the igniters will work. Now we don't need the outer sheathing at all, so go ahead and pull the wires out and strip the other ends down about half an inch. Carefully single out one copper strand from the bundle of wire and pull it off to the side. And now the other frayed wires are all garbage, so just twist them together and use a pair of scissors to cut them off the base. Now let's take a close look at the other wire. If it has nylon cording mixed in with the copper strands, you need to get rid of it. And the most effective way to eliminate it is to lick it with a flame from a candle or a barbecue igniter. Now hold the two cables side by side about a quarter of an inch apart and twist the bridge wire from the first cable so it binds together tightly and meshes in with the other strands. This will ensure the bridge wire has great electrical contact and should prevent it from unraveling. To hold the wires in place, simply lay a small piece of tape on the table so it's facing the sticky side up and press the wires down into the center. Now make sure the bridge wire is poking out around a quarter inch from the top, then bend the excess wire back and press it down beside the wires on the inside. All right, the igniter leads are completed, so let's take a quick break from all that and spend some time modifying the match heads. 
Take the matches one at a time and carefully slide them down the edge of a sharp pair of scissors. You can see it scores a very small groove right down the center of the tip. Now bring back the igniter leads and line the bridge wire up with the groove in the match head and secure it firmly in place by wrapping one side of the tape tightly over the base of the match, then reinforce it again by firmly wrapping the other half of the tape the other direction. For one finishing touch, it's good practice to burn the nylon strands on the igniter leads as well, and twist them together tightly so they'll make better contact. At this point, your electric match is finished and ready to go to work. To test them out, I tried connecting alligator clips to the leads of the igniter, then running the wires to two 9-volt batteries in parallel. Now all it takes for ignition is the press of a button to complete the circuit, or in this case, a touch of the wires to the battery terminals. The matches light off because when the circuit is completed, over 6 amps of electrical current surge through the tiny bridge wire on the top, and the electricity gets the wire so hot it ignites the chemicals in the match head, causing it to burst into... Boya, boya! Boya, boya! No, no, boya, no. Suggest. <laughs> 